This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morey. In this presentation, our teacher gives an in-depth answer to a very common question. That is, the question of the free will of man. Does man have a free will? As our teacher begins, he points out the apparent contradiction between the free will of man and the sovereignty of God. Here's Dr. Bob Morey. Let me state at the outset, I believe it isn't an apparent contradiction, it is a real contradiction. You've got to choose one or the other, and I will explain why. When you deal with the issue of free will, the first thing you must point out in terms of the grammar, how many words are involved in this phrase? Two. Which is the noun? Will. This is the noun. And what is this word free? An adjective. Someone said an adverb. <laughs> well, that's the California public school system. Okay, you have an adjective. Now, in terms of grammar, before you define the attributes of something, the adjectives that describe that something, you must first define the noun. In other words, which of these words has to be defined first? The word will. The word will. And of course, this is where we have our first problem. Because the moment we are talking about the will of man, this leads us to the subject of anthropology. Anthropology. It's from two Greek words, anthros meaning man, and ology or logos meaning the study of man. Biology, the study of life. Theology, the study of God. Anthropology is that branch of science, philosophy, and theology that attempts to define what man is as distinct from God and the rest of creation. So anthropology is focusing on human beings. It is not talking about God. It is not talking about nature. It's not talking about baboons and other primates. It is a discussion of humanity, man qua man. Now, there are various ways of doing anthropology. One can do it from the standpoint of the relativism of modern science. Uh, you can take B.F. Skinner at Harvard, who wrote a book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity where man is denied as a concept. As you know, you have some professors from Columbia University who have caused quite a stir. They have said, we must rid ourselves of the concept of the unity of mankind. There is no such thing as mankind. There is no such thing as human rights or civil rights. There is no dignity to humanity. The idea of an Adam and Eve model and all human beings are one in nature and all of them have the same rights and responsibility, we must throw those concepts away, says B.F. Skinner, because they came from the Bible. Once we decided the Bible is a fraud, then we can no longer keep up the pretense that man has dignity, worth, and significance, we deny anthropology. Instead, what modern science wants to discuss is zoology. Man has been re uh, reduced to a primate. The one professor at Columbia University has made the statement that the dark races evolved from the chimpanzee the oriental races evolved from orangutans and the white evolved from lemurs. 
so that instead of saying there was originally an Adam and Eve, there are multiple primatal ancestors to the variety of the animals which people mistakenly call human beings. And you see, this is the result, as Schaefer has said, once you get rid of God, God is dead. Then when it comes to the issue of the angels, you say angels are dead. Well, then man is dead. And then you finally have animals. And then you have things. And you get rid of animals. And all of reality is simply reduced to things that have no more significance or meaning than any other thing. But you see, when a Christian wants to study anthropology, to look at the nature of man according to the word of God, that will give you a biblical perspective on anthropology that you will not find in unbelieving science or philosophy. So when you're talking about the will of man, this immediately deals with the issue of anthropology. It also deals with the issue of history. Where did this phrase come from? Did anyone ever read it in the book of Genesis? Raise your hand if the word free will was ever found in Genesis. What about Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? And as we go through all the books of the Bible, except for the King James, will you ever find it? And the one reference, free will offering, doesn't count. It's not even in the Hebrew free and not the word will. Well, where did this concept come from? Where did it enter into the issue? Why is it a controversy? Why are people describing it? What is the will of man that people are talking about? And you have to define that before you can discuss whether or not it's free or it's in, in bondage. This also involves scripture. To what extent should you allow the Bible to tell you what to believe about human nature? See, there are some people who believe that the Bible um, is nice for the uneducated. I was reading a statement that intelligent people can use their reason and figure out everything, but because there are these ignorant bubalas, truck drivers, waitresses, janitors, farmers, because we have these lower classes. God gave us the Bible for stupid people. But if you're really smart, you don't need the Bible at all. You can just figure it out all by yourself. Or do we take the stance sola scriptura? We're going to let the Bible talk to us about the nature of man. We're going to let the Bible talk to us about history. We're going to let the Bible decide if man has a will and whether or not it's free. But then this throws us in the issue of philosophy because that's really the arena where the discussion has gone on for years. The philosophers use a special word, given. I was reading William Lane Craig the last couple of weeks, several of his articles, and he would say, given that man has a free will, given that the universe is based on chance, given that nothing is predetermined, given, and I thought to myself, I ain't giving you anything. You may think it's given, but I ain't giving you anything. In philosophy, you have people who begin the discussion of free will, but never define their terms. They're assuming what they believe to be true. Can they ever really enter into a critical investigation of it if they've already assumed it is true? They make statements like, if man doesn't have a free will, then he is not accountable for his actions. You'd say, well, that's a nice statement. Where did that come from? Well, everybody knows. I said, no. Well, it should be given. I ain't giving you anything. You got to work for it when it comes to old Maury. Well, you see, when you discuss the issue of the will of man, there is, first of all, you must understand, in terms of biblical anthropology, 
and biblical psychology, there is no concept in the 66 books of the Bible that you have a will. Now, you see, we are creatures who have now entered the 21st century. How many of you have ever heard of faculty psychology? One. How many of you heard of the Dewey Decimal System? John Dewey, the writer of the Humanist Manifesto. Now, you got the flavor of where he stood in terms of God? He said that man should be looked at as divided into three things. And every one of us in elementary school and in high school and college, we were taught the humanistic philosophy of faculty psychology. You have three things. You are made up of three things, like three marbles in a glass. And since this is California, three olives in a martini glass. What is the first thing you're made of? What do you have? Intellect. You have an intellect. Now, that can be debatable, all right? What's the next thing you were told in elementary school that you have? A will. And what's the third thing? Emotions. How many of you heard that man is made up of intellect, emotions, and will? How many of you were told that? Now, unthinking Christians being molded by the world run around saying, I have an intellect, I have a will, and I have emotions. The problem is this, who's the I? Do you have a wallet in your pocket? Do you have a will somewhere in you? Is it located in your spleen? Where's your will? I'm not talking about in the safety deposit box, you know, by the famous lawyer team of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. <laughs> do you actually have, do you have a will? Do you have an intellect? Do you have emotions as entities, as things that have reality? The answer is no. You think, you choose, and you feel. You don't have emotions. Where would you have them? In a sack? Hip pocket? Shirt pocket? In case you're Spock, you, you deny them. In case you're something else, you, you exploit them. You see, the very issue of whether or not you have a will is the number one importance because I'd have to say based upon the position of biblical anthropology which John Dewey did not write you don't have a will you are a being a conscious ego you know you exist you make choices and when you choose it is not a will that is doing the choosing you're doing the choosing for example, when you sin, who's to blame? Now, there was this preacher. Uh, he came to town, and all he had was a guitar, good looks, and the gift of gab, and he became the pastor of this huge charismatic church that had a 1,000 people in a year and a million-dollar budget. Down the street was this little Reformed church. The guy had preached. For 10 years, had 100 people. You get a little bit bigger, a little bit down, 100 people. And he's looking at this guy. He has 1,000 people, man. And he doesn't know Greek. He doesn't know Hebrew. Never went to school. He has a guitar, the gift of gab, good looks, and he's in. And then he saw on the marquee, it said, next week I will reveal the identity of the thief on the cross who was crucified next to Jesus. So this pastor says, I can't let this go. So he went to see the guy. He says, look, you ain't even been to Bible college. You didn't even go to seminary. 
Nobody knows who these thieves were that died on the Christ, as I do. How would you know? I'm telling you, I'm an educated Reformed theologian. You don't know. I don't know. He said, no, I do know. And I'm going to tell everybody next Sunday from my pulpit. Well, who do you say was the thief on the cross? The father of the Apostle Paul was crucified next to Jesus. Oh, come on, give me a break. Where did you get that? The Bible tells us that. Where? Paul tells us, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> what he did was take a metaphor, a metaphor. He didn't mean literally his old man. He didn't remain an old nature. What he meant in the context was the old way of living. I don't live that way anymore since Jesus has come into my heart. But what Christians so often do is make literal what was intended to be a metaphor. You don't have a will. You don't have an intellect. Either you think or you don't. You are a being who thinks. It's not a part of you doing the thinking. You think. Matter of fact, when you die, who goes to heaven? Well, I go to heaven, but I leave my intellect, my will, and my emotions behind. What gets saved? I've heard people say, well, only part of you get saved. Your spirit gets saved, but the soul ain't saved. They're, they're making literal, they have an anthropology that is screwed up. You don't have a will. You are an individual created in the image of God, and you think, you choose, you feel, you reflect, you meditate, you pray, you worship, you do many things. Thus, the first point is that the discussion over whether your will is free or is it in bondage is stupid, because you ain't got one to begin with. Secondly, this issue here, free. The word free always must be in terms of free from something to something. So, you want to get married, you have to take a blood test. Why do you have to have a blood test? to see that you're free from what? Syphilis, gonorrhea, since we're in California, HIV, free from certain diseases, free to health, and you're disease-free and you're ready to get married. Freedom in a, con in a, in a vacuum means nothing. You've got to be free from slavery, to liberty, free from tyranny. The word free necessarily involves movement from something to something. Take, for example, in Thessalonians, God said, you turned away from the idols to worship the true and living God. Repentance is away from to something else. Then you ask the person, now, we know that this is actually a verb. We choose, we make choices, we are willing or not willing. But really, we don't have a now, we don't have a will in that sense. And you want to say that when we make our choices, we are free from something to something. What are we free from? And the humanist will say, free from God. Hmm. So number one, you think we have to be free from God. Does the Bible teach? that we are free from God? How many of you have ever prayed for someone to be saved? Raise your hand. When you pray, did you say, now, Lord, leave them alone. Lord, don't interfere. Let them on their own. Anybody pray like that? You say, God, smash them down. Lord, sick them with the Holy Ghost. Think about the authors of Scripture. 
if the authors of the Bible were totally free from any control of God, could they write a Bible that had no errors? No, were there stupid ideas, scientifically speaking, in the Old Testament age and even in the first century? Were there stupid ideas around? Yeah. Why don't we find them in the Bible? How can you explain a Bible without stupid ideas, contradictions, mistakes, and errors if you say God is never in control of anyone? And of course, people will say, God is a gentleman, and he would never interfere with your will. I thank God he interfered with mine. The Bible says, how many seek after God? So if anybody ends up with God, who must have done something? Matter of fact, Philippians 2, God is working in you what? The willing and the doing. The only reason you're here tonight, I'll be read dead honest, you have to give the glory to God that you're here instead of watching television tonight or that you're here instead of in a bar looking for someone to spend the night or out getting drunk. God puts in us the willing and the doing of his good pleasure. No one seeks after God. No one understands. No. Where did this whole business that we have to be free from God, we have to be free from God, that came from, in terms of history, the pagan philosophers who said we will not have this man to rule over us. We will not acknowledge God as sovereign. Man must be free from God. Now, how does that work in ethics? Free from rules. What does that mean? If you're going to be free from God, it means you get to be free of his Ten Commandments? What is that called? Ethical relativism. You, they're the ten suggestions, not the ten rules. And God doesn't tell you anything. So there goes morality. When it comes to truth, if you're going to be free from God, does that mean you get to be free from his Bible? Yeah, you can make up any theology you want. Any, meeny, miny, mo. I just heard on tape today a, a radio guy <laughs> preaching that there shall be, I will have said, I, he believed in the resurrection of Lassie and the shrubbery everlasting. And he was arguing for the resurrection of animals and of plants. And I'm listening to this. And I thought, this guy is now joining Benny Hinn, who said Adam flew to the moon. There is as much proof that Adam flew to the moon as that Fifi and Fufu and Spike will be resurrected. Now he said, our pets will be in heaven. Are there animals in heaven? And of course, I thought to myself, number one, I hope I don't have pooper scooper duty. But heaven is incorporeal. We don't have a body in heaven. We don't even have a way to pet, to pet the animal. And the animals don't have any bodies either, and they don't have immortal souls. How come their souls went there? And if they have immortal souls, how come they're not accountable as moral agents? You know, you have to have a wedding license for the dog, and they can only pair up once in life, and we tell the dog, now look, Lassie, she's yours till you die. So I'm listening to this, and he's playing to the emotions of people. Now, in the history of the Christian church, is there a creed that says, I believe in the resurrection of animals and in the plants everlasting? They don't have animals and plants in heaven. Well, what about, it says horses. <laughs> We're back to my old man was crucified with Christ. Then he wants to prove that in the kingdom there'll be animals that are resurrected. He quotes a verse, the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Did it say the resurrected lion? And whose pet was that anyway? There's nothing in the Bible, but here's the thing. If you make your theology out of thin air, you, uh, you have an emotionally distraught person whose pet died. Now, I'm a pet lover. I have a Bichon preset. I'm, I love my dog. He follows me, sits next to me, goes to bed. He's in the, in the bed. I get up. He gets up. I love this little dog. 
I'm not going to change the Bible so I get Scotty in heaven. I'm not going to change the Bible so that on the day of resurrection they're dogs. I also had Skipper. I had a lot of pets. How many of you have had more than one pet in your lifetime? You want a whole herd of these things showing up? And who's going to have to walk behind them with the pooper scooper? Because in the everlasting kingdom, do you want all that stuff? Stepping in. Imagine the saints, the angels said, Lord, have mercy. Who brought that great Dane into heaven? Lord, have... Where are you going to get that? The same thing with here. Free from the Bible, so you make up anything you want. Oh, sure, we can have pets in heaven. Where does it say that? Well, prove that it, they're not. Who has the burden of proof? He does. Well, to what? You see, I'm free from hell so that I'm free to go to heaven. I'm free from the penalty and power and presence of sin through the redemption of Christ. Therefore, I'm free to become a child of God instead of a child of the devil. The word free, you have to get the person to say, free from what? And once they say, God, I have to be free from God, his laws, his revelation, his son, his rule, his sovereignty. I've got to be free from God. Then the cat's out of the bag. The whole purpose of humanism is to say, I am my own God. I will make the laws, the rules. I will determine the fate of all things. Turn with me to Psalm 2. After we finish this series on the Trinity, we are going to be dealing with the issue of evil, God, evil, and you. And in that series, we're going to look at free will, and that is when I will give some lectures in which I will deal with that and give you some notes that in further detail so that you might understand, except for the grace of God and his control in your life, you wouldn't be here. But look at Psalm 2. Why do the nations so furiously reign together? See what it says? Why are the nations in an uproar? And the people devising what kind of thing? Vain. You know, a translation? Stupid. A stupid idea. These people are rioting and they have a stupid idea, says the Hebrew. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, the Messiah. Here's what they say. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, I'm translating the Psalms for the International Standard Version, so I did a big study why there are two different Hebrew words. One refers to the shackles around the ankles that you, you couldn't, you can't run. You're hobbled. The other refers to manacles. These unbelievers are recognizing God has hobbled them and God has them in manacles. Who is in control in the universe then? The one who has the manacles and the fetters and the keys or the ones who are manacled. So here's the stupid thing. These people said, look, we're going to get these fetters off and we're going to get these manacles off. What is God's response? He who sits in the heavens does what? Once preached a Reformed church in Grand Rapids, the pastor wrote me a letter and said, I rebuke you for undue buffoonery. There was too much laughter. I wrote him back. I said, haven't you ever noticed that God laughs? He laughs at unbelief. He laughs at wickedness. He laughs at the stupidity of man thinking he's going to overcome God. He who sits enthroned in the heavens laughs. The Lord does what? Scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. 
then this is his speech. As for you, you think you're going to tear the manacles off and destroy them and, and destroy the, the handcuffs. It ain't going to work. As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. You people can riot all you want. I am doing my will on earth as it is in heaven. Now the sun speaks. When I preach this, it's an opera in four acts. Number one, the heathen rage. Number two, the father speaks. Number three, the son declares. Now the king speaks. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. We know from Acts 13 that's a reference to the resurrection, ascension, and the session of Christ and his glorification at the right hand of the Father. You said to me, ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. That's where you Gentiles come in. And the very ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them as if they were nothing more than a clay pot. Now the playwright concludes, four acts. The heathen rage, the father declares, uh, the son speaks. Now the playwright comes out. He says, now therefore, O kings, you better get smart here. You better take warning, O judges of the earth. You better worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. You better kiss the son's feet, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Here you have the whole revolt of humanism, the attempt to throw off the shackles of God. One Reformed theologian put it this way beautifully. If God were not in control of everything, including evil, would there be any of hope that we would escape the wrath of the devil? Could we pray, deliver us from the evil one? We could not pray for God to keep us safe from the devil if the devil were not under his control. Could you pray, give us this day our daily bread, if God were not in control of your ability to work and make money? The whole process that puts bread in your mouth is under the control of God. Matter of fact, you give thanks for how many things in life? Well, then God has to be in control of how many things in order for you to give thanks for so this is J.I. Packer in his book, uh, The Sovereignty of God and Evangelism. He said, every true Christian is a Calvinist on their knees. There, there are no Arminians on their knees. When you were on your knees, you said, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving me health and breath and giving me my family and my job. And thank you, Lord, for salvation. God, I thank you for everything. It all comes by grace. And see, the idea that you've got to be free from God so you can become your own God, become your own lawgiver, find your own Mount Sinai and give your own commandments. That's the heart of humanism. And see, that's the reason it hurts when I find Christian theologians and philosophers, free will, free will, we've got to believe in free will. And they put out a banner, free will, free I think of these guys up in Kentucky, Free Will Baptist Church, singing, free will, free will. You must believe in free will. I mean, these hillbillies were singing free will. And I had to say, what do you mean by free will? We don't know, but we got to believe in it. You ever find it in the Bible? Doesn't matter, but we believe in it. Schaefer said, people put up these slogans of religious words and rally the troops and start marching and shouting, and none of them can define what's on the flag. Do I believe that I am a being created in the image of God and accountable to my creator and I must give an account of everything that I think, do, and stay, say in this life? Yes. Does that mean 
that I have a free will in the pagan sense that God will never help me or interfere with me? God better. The psalmist said, Turn me, O Lord, and I shall be turned. If God didn't give you faith, would you ever believe? If he didn't give you repentance, would you ever repent? Maybe it's because I'm more totally depraved than the rest of you. Bob Morey is hopeless. If God doesn't save me all by himself, I'm doomed, man. I am not a good person. I can never do enough good deeds. God better enter my life. God better save me and sanctify me and keep me. Oh, Lord, one of my constant, keep me as the apple of thine eye. Any of you ever pray that? Lord, keep me safe. If God doesn't keep you, is there any hope for you? No. So I want God to interfere with my will. I want God to say, hey, you're so stupid, let me guide you. Because you're going to make the stupid decision. And you're so wicked, you're going to always do sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guide you in the ways of righteousness. So this question, I'm just opening up a little bit. Any question here before I close this down tonight? Did you learn something in this session? Did anybody have some light bulbs going on? Quickly, what did you see? Yes. Romans 6, verse 18. Want to read that for us out loud, Mike? When the Bible talks about freedom, it's free from what? And having been free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now notice this. The Bible says freedom means being free from being enslaved to sin as your old master. Instead, does it say you're free to become your own person or to become the slave of Jesus Christ, where he's the master? Freedom in the Bible, when the Son sets you free, means you change masters. Sin used to be your master. Who's your master now? So there is no concept, well, I'm now free and I am my own God. Where was that in the Bible? I'm I'm honored to be a slave. I'm not free. Jesus says, go, I go. He says, come, I come. I lay down. I say, not my will. The Greek says, wishes, but yours be done. That's true religion, you say. So when you, you go through all the... I did every single place where the word free was found. Godly people don't ask to be free from God. They want more of God. They want to be intoxicated with God. They want to become addicts of God. I'm an addict. This Bible, I'm, I mainlined the Bible right in the veins. I want more of God, not less of it. So if you want to be free in the biblical sense, then it's free from sin to righteousness, free from wickedness to holiness. Yes. Yes. Well, the question, free to choose God, but see, even there, the definition means they have an objective choice, but the Bible says no one seeks after God and no one chooses God. We don't want it. We hit the floor out of the womb sinning. The only reason any of us ever choose God, the psalmist said, blessed is the man that you choose and cause to approach unto thee. Right in the psalm. There's an old saying. We love him because he what? First loved us. We choose him. He, Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. So I choose him because he chose me. I love him because he first loved me. God takes the initiative. I follow God. He does not follow me. 
I am his servant. He is not mine. Father, thank you for this time in dealing with this topic. We realize it's very deep. Ancient heresies such as Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism run very deep. Faculty psychology is woven throughout our culture. People's minds have been conformed to this world to where they think in humanistic categories. They don't even pick up a Bible to look to see if man even has a will. They have no concept of biblical anthropology whatsoever. We do pray, Lord, there might be an explosion of knowledge in our day. For my people perish for lack of knowledge. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morey. For a more in-depth study on the sovereignty of God and the myth of man's free will, call our toll-free number and ask for Dr. Morey's classic book, Studies in the Atonement. It's a book that every Christian should have right next to the Bible, for it speaks of the ultimate price that God's Son had to pay to redeem you and me. Again, Studies in the Atonement. Call 1-800-41-TRUTH. That's 1-800-41 and the word truth. Or to find out more, log on to www.faithdefenders.com.